Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title for the show is Some Nations Support Putin, also MAGA GOP. Uh, in March 2022, the, U United, uh, the UN uh, took a resolution vote on the Ukraine invasion, Putin's war. And out of the vote, 141 nations voted to deplore Putin's invasion of Ukraine. 35 nations abstained from the vote, and four supported the Kremlin in its invasion. But we know there's a lot more countries that are either directly helping Putin and his invasion or indirectly. And we're going to talk about those nations. But more importantly, there's, you know, there's physical ways of supporting a country that's purchasing oil or sending weapons. But there's a, the moral contribution, uh, how people can help Russia in this effort. And that's the MAGA GOP, which we saw some uh, inklings of here recently from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and his uh, proclamation that no longer will uh, there be blank checks written for Ukraine. Uh, we'll talk about that and more. I'd like to introduce my guests. Today we have our special, special guest, Chuck Crumpton. We have, of course, always my co-host, Jay Fidel, and last but not least, our contributor, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Tim. You know, Jay, in the intro, I just mentioned there's ways that these countries are helping Vladimir Putin, uh, specifically China with their purchases of oil. Um, Iran recently has been identified, I believe, by the CIA as um, the ones that are supporting them with the deadly drones that's causing a lot of damage to Ukraine's infrastructure system. The power plants, electric, you know, electric plants. And um, what are we seeing from these countries? What are, what are the um, explicit things they're doing to help Putin? And maybe some of the behind the scenes activities that these countries are, are doing to help Vladimir Putin in his invasion. Well, you can, you know, we know that they're supplying mercenaries through the Wagner Group. We know that. Um, that goes beyond the uh, the countries that you mentioned uh, as part of the four that um, you know opposed aid to Ukraine uh, or condemnation of uh, Russia in the United Nations. But there may be other other things too. There may be uh, espionage. There may be sharing of intelligence. We really don't know. Um, suffice to say, is a good guess to say that they're doing something else besides buying oil and gas. And then there's, there's the moral thing. Um, you know, they're, it's, it's depressing to find that these countries are opposing the United States position, uh, at least the current United States position. We can talk about that. Um, and that they are, uh, you know, they are supporting a, a psychopathic uh, dictator. Um, that's, that's really troublesome. Um, and, and the reason why, of course, is that Putin is um, influencing them. He's influencing countries in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere in the world, uh, either through economic, uh, you know, uh, pressure or intimidation or who knows what, you know, leader by leader. But he's he's been undermining their moral suasion, their norms, and and it's regrettable that you know the world does not universally, unanimously condemn him. You know, um, I mentioned Iran giving their drone technology to, it's not really technology, they're pretty basic drones, but they're quite effective. They're kamikaze drones, and, and Vladimir Putin has taken advantage of that offer and is doing quite well with those drones. But how should we look at um, Belarus? Remember, they allowed uh, Russian troops to stage in their country. That was a staging area before the invasion took place in February. They've allowed uh, Russia to fire missiles from their, their sovereign soil. They've uh, conscript, conscripted doctors to enforce and press them into service to take care of the uh, Russian wounded. That article is just coming out. Uh, they've allowed uh, the refueling dump areas for Russia. And um, they've allowed Russian jets over their airspace. To what degree do we say um, Belarus is really um, a very close access power to Russia, and should we be treating it as such? That's a delicate question. Fact is that, uh, uh, what's his name, Lewinchenko? Um, yes, President Lewinchenko. 
He's a puppet of Putin. He's been a puppet of Putin for a long time. And he has allowed this sort of thing for a long time. Maybe we haven't focused sufficiently on it, you know, to reveal it, spotlight it for the world. Uh, last I saw on it, though, is that Putin could have his way with Lubachenko um, on anything but boots on the ground. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's the standard here. Uh, whatever Putin wants, Putin gets from, from Belarus, except uh, Lubachenko has, has said no to, uh, to allow um, to use his uh, military uh, in the war. Um, and, you know, and that's not a big deal in the sense that Belarus doesn't have a military. I think their total, um, you know, total number of um, troops is something 40, 50,000. It's really small stuff. So Putin is really getting all he can uh, from Lubachenko and Belarus. Let me and, ask you this. Is it time for the EU and the United States to consider sanctions against Belarus? I, I think anyone who uh, cooperates with uh, Putin and, and offers him this kind of assistance, no, no question about Iran, maybe other, other countries should have sanctions too. I mean, India is not our friend on this. They're buying um, oil and gas from Putin. They're doing other things to support Putin. Uh, they voted against uh, Ukraine and the United Nations. That's really you know, disgraceful. They're supposed to be a democracy, but they're moving right. Uh, Modi is moving right. A lot of countries are moving right, and, and their action in supporting Putin is a, you know, a kind of expression of that. Um, as for whether Belarus should be subject to sanctions, I, I think it's a great idea. I don't know why Biden doesn't do that. Um, the, the e I don't know if uh, Belarus is in the EU, uh, the EU could take action against it. The U.S. could take action against it. There should be, could be sanctions against it. Uh, they are doing everything they possibly can do to help Putin. Okay, thank you, Jay. Chuck, to you, um, by the way, thank you for coming on today. Appreciate it. Uh, to you, you know, even in our own country, um, we seem to have key GOP members, the Speaker of the House that comes to mind, uh, Kevin McCarthy, almost lending moral support in that which Putin has been waiting for, and that is to try to fracture the uh, unity in the European Union and certainly uh, any support for Ukraine from the United States. And it came in the form of a very pronounced statement that there will be no more blank checks as it pertains to support for Ukraine. We also had um, Margaret Taylor Greene, you know, not, not the spokesperson for the the GOP, but certainly a, a key leader for the MAGA GOP. And she said she's sick and tired of billions of dollars being spent for Ukraine when that money could better be served at the southern border. We also have Katie Vance who's basically making his statements, basically following the Trump lead on uh, America first and his, his viewpoints of isolation. To what degree is the GOP, Chuck, um, I won't say aiding and abetting Putin, but certainly not making it easy for the Biden administration to have a, a unified front as we support Ukraine. Okay, well, in mediation, one of the country's great mediators, David Hoffman in Boston at Harvard, coined a phrase called reactive devaluation, which is fancy for, if the guy on the other side says it, I'm again it. Mm -hmm. So for the GOP, this is election season. Anything is a ground for attack against the Democrats. The only thing that they can attack concerning the Ukraine, because the support is popular nationally, is the money. Because the money relates to their primary election issue which is inflation. Inflation generated during Trump's time by tax cuts that drove an incredibly increasing wedge between the upper elite wealth and the rest of the country's resources. Their pitch is basically, hey, Biden touched it last, it must be his fault. Mm -hmm. What well, is it, who touches it last? That's the blame that goes to everyone, every president. True points. And, and there's kind of 
Hey, you asked a good question about Belarus and, and Iran and the contrast between those two situations it relates to that same kind of reactive devaluation tar the other guy issue, which is for Iran, anything against the US and its leadership is worth supporting. Right. No matter what it is. And we, if that has impacts on the EU, so much the better. For Belarus, the situation is different. But Jay, I think, characterize it really well. You've got a puppet leader who is hanging by a thread dependent completely on Putin for not being annexed, taken over, or replaced. Yeah, Chuck, let me mention that Belarus is one of the poorest countries, if not the poorest country in Eastern Europe, it has no money. It is that's, absolutely dependent on Putin. That, that's a great point, because the answer to Tim's question is, what would you sanction? <laughs> In yeah, what's left to sanction? Okay, Good they don't point. have oil and gas reserves. They don't have. I mean, they're a staging area, but so what? Yeah, were you surprised, Chuck, um, when Senator Leader, uh, Senator Minority Leader uh, McConnell, basically came out very strongly uh, in support and in opposition to Kevin McCarthy, McCarthy's statement? Uh, he said the following: The Biden administration and allies need to do more to supply um, tools for Ukraine and thwart the Russian aggression. And he made a special point to say that all support so far for Ukraine has been a, a unanimous bipartisan support of Ukraine. So he came out very boldly and didn't care about what, by embarrassing Kevin McCarthy or not. He basically drew a, 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 a you know, line in the sand saying the GOP will support Ukraine, at least in the Senate. Were you surprised that he came out that boldly? Not at all. McConnell was there before all these guys, Trump, Rubio, Cruz, the rest of them. He'll be there after them. His base in Kentucky is virtually unshakable. And his strength is he can bring every Republican vote to the table. And he can do that because he has balanced his access to the Republican donors, the reserves, the power of the contributions and the electoral support for them. He doesn't have to depend on Twitter and those guys. He provides the support that gets those guys the resources to be able to make the races close enough where they have a chance to win. McConnell knows exactly where his strengths are. He kind of reminds me of one of our late judges and former state senators, James Wakatsuki, who was known for his ability to not only marshal votes, but count votes. McConnell is an expert at that. He does it probably better than just about anybody. The ability of Nancy Pelosi to be able to do that as well as she has in the House, despite a divided Democratic base, and people like Manchin and Cinema and the Progressive Caucus and others. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you got to give her credit too. But McConnell is literally unmatched. I mean, Sam Irvin and those guys from the olden days, Bob Dole, nothing compared to McConnell's ability to bring every single Republican vote, even against things that have 60, 70 percent popular support. Yeah, I, I think um, Kevin McCarthy realized his power and strength just recently because <laughs> he recanted uh, his statement about the blank check and he said, I was taken out of context. So I think um, being taken to the woodshed by McConnell uh, was sobering thought for uh, Kevin McCarthy. And um, he quickly has backtracked or moonwalked away from his blank check statement, which I think is very funny. Uh, you put thank it you, Chuck. Very well. You put it very well, Tim, because what McConnell has reminded McCarthy is, bro, you're not in context yet. We haven't won the midterms yet. You're not Speaker of the House yet. So if you want to get there, show a little respect. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing, Cynthia. Why? <laughs> because I think that the only thing McCarthy respects is power and money. So... <laughs> All right, speaker or not. <laughs> well, you know, Cynthia, I want to get your, I want to get your thoughts on, 
you know, some re these recent overtures from the mega GOP. I won't say the GOP. I'll say the mega GOP because they are following a script from Donald Trump. Donald Trump's praise for Putin is genius and savvy. Uh, his go it alone, uh, America first, isolationist position. Uh, yeah, we have the mega GOP basically trying to say, uh, you know, su support for Ukraine isn't a top priority. What do you think about that? Their position they're taking, and is it a losing strategy because most Americans do support Ukraine? I think it is a losing strategy. And, and to answer one of the things that Jay was talking about, Belarus has been a member of the EU since 2009. Just Thank so, you. Just Thank for you. a matter of fact. Okay, um, so I think that, um, you know, the, the House passed $40 billion for aid. This was just recently. So it wasn't just the Senate that was bipartisan. The House was bipartisan too. So I think you're right that um, McCarthy's kind of biting his own nose off to spite his own face because he's, he's, it's not gonna carry well with the rest of everyone in, his, you know, in the Republican party, just those few GOPs. And we gotta remember in the beginning of this back in February, they were praising Putin. Remember when That's correct. Um, that is correct. Trump came out and said he's a genius. He's real savvy with what he's doing. And then all of the MAGA GOP, I'll call them that. I want to call them something else. I know you do. But yeah, I will we'll keep, we'll keep it to MAGA. <laughs> so the MAGA GOP has um, completely came out in support of Putin that what he's doing is right. He's just getting his country back together as if the Soviet Union was something that was good and should be put back together. Um, so they just don't have a realistic view of what's really happening in Europe. And, and like you said, that America first stuff, which will completely um, imperil America, I think in the eyes of the rest of the world. And especially after everything that Biden has done to get NATO knitted back together and strong, I think if, um, if the house decides to try to undermine that, it's gonna really hurt NATO, which we know the MAGA GOP led by Trump want to do. So it's sort of all going with that. And I think that we don't really hear about it on the news that the media is just treating the MAGA GOP as if they were rational, you know, respectable people that should be treated that way instead of separating them out. It's just been recently, and it's only on MSNBC or NBC that I really hear that happening mm -hmm. um, is to sort of you know, separate out the MAGA GOP from the rest of the GOP. And I think until we do that, our, our hope, all hope is lost, really, because those MAGA GOP that are in their races right now trying to get elected and are looking like they might be, um, we've got to separate them out from normal people. So, and we've got to do it quickly because what, we've got two weeks until we vote. So it's almost too late. All right. Um, you are quite correct in what you state as the initial um, praise for Putin and his efforts in Ukraine from Donald Trump and his acolytes, the MAGA GOP. Uh, they switched, though. They switched because why? Was it some consultant saying this is you're going against the, the polls of uh, most Republicans? Or was it some other reason they've switched? So that's a two-part question. Why did they switch uh, from praising Putin to supporting Ukraine and it's um, you know the many billions of dollars we've sent them? And secondly is, how does that change if the House of Representatives swings back to the Republicans? Well, I think the problem with the MAGA GOP is that they will say whatever they need to say 
to get the most reaction, good reaction from people, to buy their votes, to buy their support. They will lie. We know it is their, their strong suit is how to lie and when to lie. So first, you know, they're talking about Putin and how they support him. And then suddenly it's not the popular thing like you suggest. So they, they drew back. They didn't really stop. Um, I mean, they didn't really start to support Ukraine. They just stopped being vocal about supporting Putin. I think they just got quiet. I don't think they turned around and said, oh, well, now we think Ukraine should get everything. They just sort of shut up. Okay, do they spark talking. up if they win the House? Oh, they're going to come out full bore with it. You think How so? How dare we spend all that money on another country? We should be spending it on ours, except for the fact that some of these G MAGA GOP that are saying these things are the ones that got PPP loans and then got them forgiven in the, the you know, to the tune of a million dollars. Even Marjorie Taylor Greene had hundreds of thousands of PPE dollars that were forgiven. So all this, you know, we need to be fiscal is just, it's nonsense. It's a no, lot. Let's layer over, let me layer over Chuck's comments about Mitch McConnell and the strength and power he brings to the table. Um, Mitch McConnell's not gonna swing that way. I, I doubt he will. Um, if the house is taken by the GOP um, and you, according to your prediction, they'll spark up more about waning support for Ukraine. What does Mitch McConnell do about it? And um, will he be successful to put them back in their box? Well, I think that Mitch McConnell realizes what very few people are talking about. And that is that Ukraine has more lithium in its ground than any other country in the world. And right now with everything turning to lithium batteries, boy, whoever has control and power and voice in Ukraine is going to be in a better position. And I think that um, Mitch McConnell can see those kind of, he sees the long game. He, he has those, he doesn't have that short-sighted view that I think people like Kevin McCarthy and um, Marjorie Taylor Greene have. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, Jay, um, just before the show, we were talking about um, House Representative uh, Jayapal. Uh, she is the chair of the Progressive Party uh, of the Democrats. And this letter that went to the Biden administration about um, strongly encouraging them to negotiate a peace settlement uh, uh, with, with Putin. Uh, we talked about that. And to what degree does that help Putin? To what degree is that a moral support that the Democrat current administration could be fractured? Does it, does it give Putin uh, a reason to try to wait things out? I think it's only part of a huge peace well of change. You know, you, you talked about the hypocrisy of the Republicans who supported Ukraine uh, earlier this year. Um, changing their minds, at least some of them. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're in the middle of a sea change on that issue. Um, she reflects a sea change on the progressive side. And the letter she wrote and then withdrew was wrong and ill-advised. And, uh, and I'm personally, you know, disappointed in her for writing the letter and the progressive group now has no credibility. They, they, they held up the infrastructure bill for months and, and now this, anybody with half a brain would have known that this is a very damaging to the administration, damaging to Ukraine. Um, because it reflects a fracture, as you said, as you suggested. Um, so, but it's only part of the, the sea swell. There are other things happening here. Uh, you know, Maloney in Italy is moving to the right. She's not going to support Ukraine. Um, if uh, Le Pen wins the next election in France, she's not going to support Ukraine. Um, we have a, a kind of chaos going on in the UK, not clear what they're going to do. Um, and that, and that's really regrettable, uh, not only on the basis of their government policy, but on the basis of their economy in general. 
they may not be able to help. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about uh, Olaf Scholz in Germany and how he is holding back on money and military equipment to Ukraine and being attacked for it. But the fact is he's holding back. Um, so what we have is a fracture happening globally. You know, it goes beyond what you and I were talking about a minute ago in terms of the countries that are not supporting Ukraine. But now countries that used to support Ukraine are not following through in their promises. And indeed, the United States is not really following through in its promises, um, both in terms of money and in terms of military equipment. Um, and, you know, the drones are having their way. Um, so we, we have a sea change that we're, that's happening right now. And that's a, a static statement of it. But if you look forward to the elections in two weeks, it's uh, more than likely that the Republicans will take the House, more than likely that they will be subject, vulnerable to uh, Trump's position on things. And Trump would like nothing more, as Chuck suggested, than to attack Biden in every conceivable way. That's his, you know, you want to know what his policy is? It's to attack Biden. That's it. Then everybody who follows him um, will attack Biden. And if the... Uh, if the House turns Republican, whether it's MAGA re Republican or halfway, they will attack Biden. This will be a wonderful point of attack because as the economy goes further to a recession, as we struggle with uh, inflation, um, this is you know a, a, a part of the whole process. Just take that, swing it around, and attack Biden for spending money um, on Ukraine. There was another article in the Times uh, yesterday or today, today I guess, about. Um, about why people are in Trump's space. And it's really interesting. It's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost oversimplistic to say they want to win. They want to win the election. They want power. And they'll do anything to get power. And the reason they follow Trump, the reason they follow the big lie, and the big lie coming in two weeks, that big lie, the one that's going to result in secretaries of state doing strange things and and, uh, and of course, uh, litigation for years about who won. Um, you know, th that is just a way of uh, retaining power. Chaos is a way of retaining power. And you know, if you want to win, you follow Trump. And if Trump says the big lie, you know, you accept that. And so we have a real problem in MAGA GOP, but in GOP in general. So the House controls the funds, remember? The House is the, mon is the money part of the legislature of the Congress, and um, they are they're very critical in terms of whether they can keep on funding Ukraine. The Senate is not certain. You know, Fetterman is not certain. God knows what you know whether the polls we talked about this before um, are 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 true. There, there was another article I think in the Washington Post questioning whether we should listen to these polls. Who knows what's going to happen in the Senate? Who knows how powerful the GOP and the MAGA GOP and, and Trump, you know, is in terms of the electorate and the base in this country. I am not optimistic. We could lose both uh, chambers of Congress. Um, very problematic. And, and, and one of the things that's clear is that um, what is emerging here is, a, is an isolationist uh, approach, an isolationist nationalistic um, feeling in the country and among them. Uh, and them in Congress, you know, determining policy and making votes against Ukraine. So um, if I were Zelensky, I'd be very concerned that uh, in Europe and other places in the world and in the U.S., people, countries are moving to the right. Not just their leaders, people are allowing them to do this. There is a new, a new, a new time in the air, uh, including the U.S., and I don't think he can count on having continued support. So yes, J.F. Powell's move was stupid. J.F. Powell's move uh, showed a fissure uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the will uh, to support Ukraine, but it's, uh, it's also a sea swell that's uh, in many, many directions. And I, don't, I think what's gonna happen is we don't, we wind up uh, being completely hypocritical about it, not supporting Ukraine, including the man on the street who was much more interested uh, in a gallon of gas, uh, in inflation, in the grocery store, than he could give a rip about the liberal world order. Okay, thank you, Jay. Chuck, are you? Um, what's your take on the letter from Representative Japayapal 
to the Biden administration and certainly the 30 signatures she got on that letter. Uh, what's your take on that letter? And uh, was it damaging? Uh, did it give Putin more uh, hope that uh, he could wait things out? I think the effect is much less than going back to McConnell and his deeper and longer term understanding of the reasons for the strategy. The billions and billions of dollars that Congress, both House and Senate, have approved for the Ukraine, those are not going into Ukrainian bank accounts. They're going into defense contractors and intelligence, U.S. bank accounts for aid in weaponry, in defense, and in intelligence, which are critical to Ukraine's successes militarily and politically. <clears throat> McCarthy may think that in the short term, <clears throat> casting doubt about US support for Ukraine may erode the unity and the strength of NATO that has been a really big foreign policy advantage for the Biden administration. <clears throat> but McConnell understands, hey, that money is going to the people who are the hugest sector of our donor base. <laughs> and with Afghanistan reduced, and most of the other places where we were putting a lot of money, Iran, Syria, and others reduced, this is a place to funnel huge amounts of the defense appropriations, which continue to grow even if US participation in foreign wars theoretically superficially decreases. So follow the money. Good and point, Chuck. I don't Excellent think point. It's going to have any impact on that at all. The love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> all right, we've run out of time. I'm going to go around the table for last thoughts. Cynthia, I will start with you. Your last thoughts about this topic. I think that Chuck is exactly right. It's all about money. It's all about greed, power and greed. And, and he's, his point about the fact that the money we're giving them isn't cash money. We're giving them, you know, weapons and weapon machinery. And those are things that are made here in America. So that's actually going into our coffers, like you said, Chuck. And I think it's an excellent point, really. Because that I was going to say that same thing. So I was really... Except for I'm like, okay, now what do I say? Because he just said it. No. Don't you have a quote for us? Good job. Of course I do. Okay, you know, let's hear it. <laughs> and this is a quote from one of the, um, from Representative Sarah Jacobs, uh, uh, the Democrat from California, who signed on to that letter, says, timing in diplomacy is everything. It's such an important point. I signed this letter on June 30th, but a lot has changed since then. I wouldn't sign it today. And I think there's a lot of them that are saying the exact same thing. And yeah, maybe in the beginning in February, it was possible to try to get some sort of diplomatic action going. And we did. We were sending diplomats over there. Ukraine was sending their diplomats over there. And it wasn't going to work. And they saw that it was just a waste of time. And all it was doing was giving Putin more time to undermine and do what he wanted to do. And so I think the fact that this letter was released right now is, I think was maybe even done out of spite in, on purpose to cause trouble by someone. So, so maybe it's possible that it was someone on her staff, but, and maybe it's someone on her staff that wants to undermine things because otherwise there's no other reason for it. I, okay. You know. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia, very much. Jay, to you. Hmm. Uh, well, I, um, um, I think we have to keep our eye on the election here. And um, the election's coming in two weeks and it will have a profound effect on democracy as everyone says, and on the country and on the Congress. And uh, if we have just the House turning Republican, we have much greater control by Trump on all of, of, of these issues. Um, and uh, he, he's going to try to do damaging things for sure. Um, I think the Democrats are, are not together. And that's demonstrated by the Jayapal letter. 
Um, and I think that uh, the Senate is still at risk in terms of turning um, MAGA Republican. And if the, the Senate turns, you know, uh, your friend McConnell may not be, uh, you know, in, in office. Um, so I'm not optimistic about this. I'm not optimistic for the country, the Congress, the people. We've discussed all these things before. And I'm not optimistic for Ukraine. I think we have a kind of, um, you know, the, the fickle finger of fate is moving. The, uh, the, the news cycle is moving. There's a kind of fatigue, a sea change, as I mentioned. So watch out how uh, what is happening today, what looks like, you know, the reality today could change dramatically in two weeks' time. All right, Jay, thank you very much, as always. Chuck, you get the last word for today. Yeah. Look at the money, right? Billions and billions, theoretically, for the Ukraine, but as Cynthia points out, into American defense and intelligence contractors' pockets. The primary portion of the MAGA GOP donor base followed almost simultaneously by millions and millions coming out of that MAGA GOP donor base into candidates in these 2022 midterms many or most of whom are far-right mega GOP candidates, election deniers and others. The likelihood that they're gonna cut off that funding before the 2024 elections seems small. All right. McConnell's you know, you, you said something that just caught my ire because if I recall, some money from the Democratic Party went to fund these wing nuts and uh, that's unforgivable, but that's another show in another day. Well, we like do to have a show tomorrow where we're going to examine Trump's relationship with Putin. And uh, if, you follow, if you follow that relationship, I know you have to follow the money. If you follow that relationship, you will see that Trump and his base want Putin to win. They want to support Putin, and Putin wants Trump to win. That unholy alliance has a lot to do with this, money or no. Okay. Good point, Jay. All right, Chuck, did you have anything else to add? No, I just think oh. Jay is spot on because Trump sees connections as power elite corrupt connections. Correct. <laughs> Others have a different worldview than that. All righty. I want to thank my guest, my special guest, Chuck Crumpton for today. Thank you, Chuck, for, for appearing on the show. Uh, my co-host, Jay Fidel, and certainly Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Thank you one and all. Won't you join us next week for American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicell, your host. We'll see you then. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.